Stop standing there and sit down. Thank you. So, am I blocking the um, slides for everybody? Just a sec. Again, so um, any talk about Moo really has to start by talking about Moose. Uh, because, I, yeah, if, if I didn't love Moose so much, I wouldn't have written Moo in the first place. And no, you are not allowed to make a joke about loving Moose. Um, it's the less than three. It's a thing that people under 50 do, Stephen. It's okay. Uh, so... 0.01 of Moose came out in 2006. Um, quite possibly before Yuval Cogman was old enough to drink, which is kind of impressive. Um, I think I started using it around 0.18. That, that's the first version I remember having. Uh, so um, that was early 2007. Um, and that basically came about because we've been using class C3 heavily in DBIX class. Stephen grabs me um, on IRC and goes, mm, there's this thing that I've been working on that I think you might like better than class C3. Yeah, yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> anyway, so uh, you, what, what is Moose is, okay, you, you're all going to have some answer to this question by now. But what, what I really want to, want to say here is what it is to me and that, how that shaped my thoughts about things. Um, First started using Moose, I, I basically sourced dive a lot of the code, understood at least enough of it to figure out what was going on. And when this is amazing, this is the object system that I always knew Perl 5 was capable of hosting. Uh, and being, being able to see the possibility of something that cool was why I'd always been able to get by dealing with raw Perl 5.0 and not hating everything. Okay, well not hating everything for that specific reason anyway. Um, so, yeah, but it, it was very much, and al I'd always had a feeling that something this good could be written. Um, but uh, it turns out Stephen could write it and I couldn't, for which I am eternally grateful. Um, I mean, if, if you look at, look at what we were using before, class accessor, really? And then you have class make methods and class base and about a billion more of the things. You know, it, it, it's open up pull, pull, pull project that you're about to try and patch. The first question to ask is not, is this OO or not? It's which of the 3,000 OO systems is the flipping thing using? Now I need to go and learn that before I can manage to add an access. Oh, really? And I mean, I, I was part of the problem to a great, to a great extent because um, the accessor system I wrote inside DBIC later got extracted to be used by other modules. So, um, there, there, there was a small amount of guilt about that, but then again, it was another part of DBIX class that I no longer had to maintain, so I kind of kept quiet and didn't argue. Um, Damien Conway made an attempt um, and wrote class STD, thereby dem demonstrating that he also isn't actually aware of what STD stands for. <laughs> um, but nobody really used that. Uh, failing to be compatible with things like data dumper just drove people insane. Um, I, I remember there was the point at which the first two or three people went, how do we use class STD with Catalyst? Um, and now normally that sort of um, fixing, you know, de dealing with that sort of level of weird compatibility stuff would have been something that I'd do. I took one look at class STD and went, you know what? I don't actually want this to work. Patch is welcome. Turns out nobody else did either, and it, it, it quietly slid away, and we stopped hearing about it after six months or so. Um, so, but the, the thing of having one class builder to rule them all is, is just such a magnificent thing. Yeah, it, it's the traditional Perl community thing. It takes us quite a while to find something that's, that's good enough for us, most of us to be happy treating it as the standard. But by the time we do, it's pretty damn cool. Um, so... Okay, in order to actually talk about Moo, I, I, this is the obvious question, except the answer is, I didn't actually stop. Um, most of my work code is still using Moose for stuff. Um, Catalyst is built on Moose, and without the meta protocol, 
we'd have some seriously ugly code in there. Um, so, I mean, that, that, was, that was a huge advantage to us. Um, every single customer I'm working with, any large application is going to be built, is going to be built on Moose. Because when you've got a daemon that takes 15, 20 seconds to start and then runs for three months providing business value, an extra second on the startup time does not matter at all. And yes, I know on modern machines it's less than a second. And then you get customers who are using Amazon EC2 and now it's a second again. <sighs> Seriously, Elastic Block Store has less I.O. than the disk in this thing. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> so. So, okay, Moose rocks, so now I have to justify Moo coming about. And I'm going to do it by blaming the Italians. Um, because in 2009, um, I went to the Italian Pearl Workshop for the first time, and I gave a talk called Antiquated Pearl. And Antiquated Pearl was basically taking a bunch of very old school tricks and showing how some of them were still useful and some of them were batshit insane and here's the replacement. Um, and the example that I built towards in that talk was WebSimple, uh, which is a PSGI micro framework. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's pretty much just bolting a dispatcher and some basic OO on top of plaque, which has been fun for me to experiment with dispatchers in. Uh, as to whether it's the ultimately friendly piece of code for people to use is something we can argue another time, because this is not the talk. Um, so I, w I wanted this thing to be usable as, as CGI script, as a CGI script, uh, which meant I needed fast startup and I needed no excess dependencies because I wanted to be able to just rsync or FTP a deploy around. Um, so I wrote my own accessors, wrote my own constructor, it, it, oh my, I did not enjoy doing this. It was so boring. I mean, seriously, right? Try, try, trying to write highly structured polymorphic code in C is more interesting than writing accessors in Perl. Uh, drove me mental. And then I, I found that I had more than one project that had, that had this sort of problem. Um, data query, which, uh, which still isn't quite released, but uh, might actually be shortly, because I'm about half a limit dialect from getting DBIX class running on it, HTML, Zoom, various other bits. Um, and the problem I had for those was, in order to get the widest user base for them, because these were meant to be very low-level things that were used in multiple ways, depending on Moose would massively impede adoption. You have, cer you have certain shops that have such a dysfunctional sysadmin situation that building a dozen packages rather than four to get a module is actually a reason to not use it because it's going to take the developers entire afternoon to deal with their crappy deployment system. You have people who are, who are still deploying as CGI scripts. Periodically, I get, I get shouted at because I've accidentally introduced an excess dependency on t into something because they're deploying as a CGI script over FTP. Every single time it's a German. Could I please ask all of you here to find whichever of your countrymen are doing this and make them stop? Anyway, um, so, I mean, the, the next thing is, why not mouse? Well, mouse can be pure pearl. Uh, it describes itself as moose minus the antlers, but I'd argue that's not actually quite true, because um, it still has a meta model. Um, so if it's still got a metal model, the antlers are just a bit smaller. And, you know, uh, sawn-off antlers are, are, are not the gangster thing, right? Um, mouse basically is moose minus minus. And that, that just isn't what I wanted. So, so I decided I was going to keep being bored stupid. And for about a year, year and a half, I wrote everything by hand every single time. I, I do not recommend this as an exercise. But by the end of it, I, I very much understood just how much I was missing Moose and which parts of Moose I missed the most. Um, and I experienced a substantial amount of uh, mental pain in the process. Next time, I think maybe I'll just try and break the other hip instead. <laughs> Seriously, though, trying to do this by hand? Okay, method modifiers. Before foo, call this other method. Simple, right? So that's how you have to implement it. That's not too bad. That's only five lines instead of three. How about after? Well, after, you now need to be able to preserve the context. So at that point, you get to write this every time. 
This is where it starts to get annoying, yeah? What about void context indeed, Stephen? However, if I'd actually fixed it for void context as well, it wouldn't have fitted on one slide. <laughs> I mean, not having intelligent accessors. You know, I, I write things like this all of the time. And you're now looking at writing that. Um, constructors are even worse, though. Okay, you have, an, you have a required attribute, you have an attribute with a default. Two lines. Here's your constructor. Every time you write this, there's a significant chance you're going to introduce another bug. Um, so I just, no. And I mean, sub, let, let's not even try and show the example for subclassing, because the, the code will be that big and still won't fit on one slide. Um, runtime role application is something I use heavily for plugin systems. Um, so in, in a moose like, you just call a function and it's done. Do it by yourself? Well, it's time to turn off strict refs and then generate a class name, fiddle with its symbol table, do some horrible things involving string either. I Really? Really? No. I, I do not want to be writing this code. Um, the funny thing, um, the my colon colon package that you can use to extend a makefile.pl is actually applied via this technique. Xutils MakeMaker was doing runtime role application several years before Moose was released. However, if you look at that, there's a reason it didn't get more popular until he made it sensible to do. Anyway, so um, a couple of years ago, yeah, still a couple of years ago, um, I was out on site with a customer in New York and spending... spending um, most of the time during the week, um, hating large-scale data on Amazon EC2. Believe me, proce processing the entire Twitter firehose in real time on a system with disks that shitty is, is, is... Well, I can understand why they decided to pay somebody else to do it, let's say. Uh, <laughs> and it, it was the weekend, I was bored. I mean, I, I went out socialising a bit in the evening, but I'm really not a cultural tourist. Um, go, going to museums and going to go ooh, look at the pretty building just isn't my thing. So instead, um, I went down to the front desk and went, can I please have 15 of the sachets for the coffee machine, all caffeinated? Uh, no, really. Went out to Subway, bought two huge sandwiches and just didn't leave the hotel room for 36 hours. Sat and wrote code. Um, so I, wrote, I, I hacked on the main code. Reba Sushi and Fru, two of the DBIX class core team, wrote tests for me. Um, and the end result was the uh, 0.009 release of Moo. So what did we get? Well, accessor generations in there. This stuff works. Um, I, we only support a subref for default uh, because I found that allowing scalars in so, so, some scalars and not others tends to result in people shooting themselves in the foot. So I couldn't be bothered. Um, I, it's all fairly simple stuff. Um, Moose, Moose provides lazy build, which was um, stolen out of one of my projects um, years ago and was, quite frankly, an awful design that we really should have thought through more before putting it into Moose Core. So I didn't copy that um, because the trouble with lazy build is it, it, it produces so many methods and adds stuff to your public API that you may not want. What you really want is just the laziness and a builder. So what we implemented was is arrow lazy that does just that, which, which to my mind is what lazy build should have been in the first place if I hadn't screwed the design up. Um, happily, uh, moosex attribute shortcuts uh, provides is lazy for moose. So you, we're still within the realms of compatible with the moose ecosystem even if this isn't exactly the same feature you get in Core Moose. Um, for method modifiers, just use class method modifiers, does the job. The only um, interesting thing that you have to do is basically stuff them into an array and replay them for all application to work. Um, one thing that's been a, an interesting source of arguments is uh, type systems. Moo explicitly does not have a type system. 
uh, basically because there's been so much arguing back and forth about mooses. And there's at least one project to build an external type system that's potentially a better idea than the uh, internal implementation. And so ba basically I decided the best thing to do, since I wasn't sure which of these was going to win and didn't want to end up with core support in move for a losing proposition, um, was just to basically push it externally. So with Moo, you have to pass a subroutine reference, and the subroutine reference has to die if it doesn't pass the type check. So that lets you control the error message to whatever level you want. And it means you can fairly trivially plug in any type system. Um, I mean, you could, in theory, plug Moose type straight into this, and it would work fine. There'd be no point doing that, because now you've loaded Moose. Just use Moose, but it would work. Um, there's also Moo X types Moose-like, which provides an equivalent system to Moose X types for Moo, um, since um, Moose's string types get kind of messy in large-scale projects. So most of the developers I'm working with that are using Moose heavily already use Moose X types for all their type constraints. <coughs> so the, 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 the sort of learning curve there is um, fairly flat, and it's still an extension. Um, so that ends up looking as, basically, it's a, it's a subroutine constant, um, which I've always liked better than strings, because it means if I get the type name wrong, the Perl compiler tells me to sod off. I always like it when the compiler goes, you're an idiot, rather than having to wait for my test suite to discover I'm an idiot. But, you know, um, another difference that does seem to surprise a lot of people, um, Moose turns on strict and warnings. Again, stolen out of a piece of my code without any thought as to whether I got the design right or not, sadly. Um, Moo uses strictures, which again, I think is the right answer for this case. So what strictures does, doesn't just turn on warnings, but it makes all warnings fatal. Because if you're writing, so far as I'm concerned, if you're deploying a production application that's going to be part of your main business system, if a warning is emitted, that means, even if, even if it's theoretically harmless, you didn't expect that to happen, so your code is now in an undefined state. Rather than having it carry on spewing to studder and hopefully still doing the right thing, I'd much rather it blew up then and there, and then we can find the bug and fix it. Um, opinions may vary on this, but, you know. Um, the other thing about strictures is, when it's run from your test suite, it adds in prohibiting indirect object syntax, kills accidental use of the multidimensional hash syntax, and stops you from using bare word file handles. These are all compile time tests, so they're either going to stop your code compiling or not, which is why running them only on the author side is sufficient. But I find the extra protection is really nice. No indirect especially um, has caught a couple of bugs that would seriously have screwed me over if, it, if the compiler hadn't been able to tell me I was wrong. Um, and the, the point of this is, be as restrictive as possible by default, because your new users are going to be the people who don't know how to change the defaults yet, and those are the people who need the most protection. <laughs> you know, if, if, you want, if you want to write your own importer replacement for Mo that turns off fatal warnings and turns normal warnings back on. It's probably about four or five lines, but I'm, I'm quite comfortable with the idea of to turn protections off, you should already know what you're doing well enough to know what you're getting into. Um, so uh, back to Moose. Um, you do, you have the, the one nice thing here is, um, if, you, if you call meta on a Moo class, you get back a Moose meta class object. Um, Moo effectively pretends to be Moose. It, um, when it detects Moose being loaded, it installs um, basically lazy objects for every single, meta every single Moo class and role that then the first time any method is called on, it traps that with an autoload and builds a real Moose meta class instance. So all of your Moose using code should never notice that the Moo code wasn't always Moose. Um, which has the great advantage that you don't need any moves, which can go horribly wrong in all sorts of really hard to debug ways. Um, Moo effectively has that capability built in because Moo is specifically designed to be the thing that you use 
as a, as a subset of Moose with the expectation that when you need Moose's features, the answer is not to install 12 Moo extensions, the answer is install Moose and get on with it. Um, so in order to enable that, I've, I've done quite a bit of work on interoperability both ways. So you can declare a Moo class, load a Moose role into it, you can use a Moo role in a Moose class, and then I thought, hmm, what shall I do? I know, I'll play Jenga. See how high I can get the stack. <laughs> so, not only if you consume a mouse roll into a moo roll, that moo roll can then be consumed into a moose roll. In, you can't do it directly because mouse has no idea what's going on because it wasn't designed for moose compatibility. Um, but if you go via moo, moo manages to pull the data in from mouse and then push it back out so moose can understand it. So um, th this is designed for people who made the mistake of using mouse to be able to port off it reasonably easily and do it one class at a time so it doesn't co it's not a, a big bang, major risk job. Um, I also, yeah, did a little bit of Jenga. Um, we went four layers deep and got bored. Uh, equally, you can have Moo atop Moose, atop Moo atop Mouse. Again, mouse has to be at the bottom or right out on the edge because, it, because it's only moo and moose that both talk to each other. Um, but it still works. Um, the whole thing is pure pearl. I've kept the dependencies to as close of a minimum as I can get um, without reinventing too many wheels. Um, now, admittedly, if you install it on a machine with a compiler, you will get some excess parts, but that's just optimizations. Um, class access accessor, if you install it, we use for any accessors we can because that's way faster than a pure Perl accessor. But all, all of this is optional. Um, at some point, I'd really like to um, steal the mouse accessor code because I do envy their XS accessors, but it's not a major problem for me at the moment. If anybody else actually likes dealing with XS code and crazy C stuff and wants to have a go, please give me a shout, I'll happily take a patch. <coughs> but the, the, the key thing here is, the only excess stuff we rely on being there is in the core. So you've got a lot of freedom for deployment. Um, it'll fat pack itself comfortably. So you can bundle Moo using code into a single script. Um, I, I was extremely pleased. One of the Postgres core developers was starting to learn Perl to replace some of his bash scripts and was on a fairly old machine that he didn't understand the CPAN config of and really didn't want to do too much installation. So I fat-packed a copy of Tiny REPL, which comes from Eval with Lexicals, and gave him a single file Perl REPL script, and he was over the moon. And it, it, being able to do this sort of stuff is really nice. I mean, yeah, in a sensible environment, you just install the modules, but sometimes it, it's helpful to have the alternative. Um, also, you know, it enables deployment via FTP. I refer you to my previous comments on the subject. Um, but th there's all sorts of other interesting things you can do as a result of this. One of the fun ones for me is Object Remote, um, where I can take a class called new colon colon on and give it a host name. And Object Remote, SSH is into, the host, into that host squirts a copy of itself over the wire by basically fat-packing itself on the fly. Um, and at that point, it instantiates the object in the process on the far side and gives me back a handle to it. And because I've got a pure pearl depth chain, this is completely transparent. The only thing I'm relying on having at the other end is a reasonable 5.8 plus pearl interpreter, uh, which for doing sort of surveys and ad hoc systems code on a, on a, on a customer platform that is high, we grew really fast under VC funding, and now we've just noticed we have this slight sysadmin problem. Um, it's been really handy. Um, if, if, you're, if, you're more inter if you're interested in that sort of stuff, uh, I'm fairly sure that my talk tomorrow is about the system that I built using this. Um, so I, basically, it works. I'm, 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 I find it a bit difficult here um, to, to find something to be really excited about here, because the point of this is, or all, the entire point of the exercise here is to get at least some of the moose goodness in an environment where we didn't. So the, the exciting thing is everybody standardizing on moose and moo and whatever else. That, that's the interesting part. 
this is just a bunch of code that I had to write to make sure that I could have my shiny sugar everywhere else I was working, as well as the um, sensible projects. Um, so, give it a go. We have declared 1.0 now, and it really does seem to be pretty solid at this point. Um, and I'd say, if, if you're asking yourself, should I or shouldn't I use Moose for a particular project? The answer to my mind is, use Move, but most importantly, use Move first. Because the whole point of using Move is that Moose will still be there later if you need the extra features. Um, so, IRC discussion, we're using hash moves for user questions, and then development is going on in hash web simple. Where for, well, it, it's kind of worked out that way, and there's no point having yet another dev channel. I'm already in about 90 IRC channels. I need another one like I need another broken bone, you know? Um, so, textually, Moo is 60% of Moose. So the joke we've always made is almost, but not quite, two-thirds of Moose. Thank you very much. So, I appear to have run a bit, a, bit sh a bit before time, so does anybody have any questions? Uh, I don't know, that, that would imply I'd read either set of documentation in the last two years. <laughs> when, when something doesn't work for me in either of them, I go and read the source code, so... I think the Moo documentation is now fairly comprehensive. And you're also in a situation where, apart from the meta model stuff, the vast majority of the Moose documentation applies. I mean, re realistically... Yeah, other, th other than the, um, sm the minor differences, which we have a long section documenting exactly what the uh, differences are. Um, the, the, the point of Moo is to basically function as a restricted pure pearl Moose. So what w the idea is, you introduce people to Moose, get them addicted to Moose because it's the real thing, and then if they end up in an environment where they can't use the real thing, Moose there to support that. Anybody else? Cool. <laughs> So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>